Let's start our first conversation. I am going to introduce our panelists. Zsa Zsa Fei is a leading digital strategist and founder of the first digital agency for art and formerly led digital at the Jewish Museum and the Guggenheim Museum. Eric Friedman is the director of digital learning at the John F. Kennedy Center. His team played a pivotal role in producing the center's education artist in residence Mo Willems projects over the past year, including an augmented reality app and also the wildly popular Lunch Doodles series on YouTube. Angelica Negron is a composer and a multi-instrumentalist. She composes for film and has recently received commissions by both the LA and New York Philharmonic. So coast to coast. Sangita Shrestova is director of research at the Civic Paths Group at USC. She has written extensively and developed projects related to civic imagination and media, participatory cultures, performance, and new media, including the recently published book, Popular Culture and the Civic Imagination, Case Studies of Creative Social Change. So we are going to jump in. My first question is, what have we learned? So what have you learned from teaching or facilitating or creating online over the past few months and since Angelica has been both creating and facilitating? Uh, Angelica, let's start with, with you. Hi, I'm Angelica. And to describe myself and my surroundings, I'm a Latina woman with light color, light color skin, um, short wavy purple hair, and I'm wearing a dark blue polka dot short sleeve dress, um, and I'm sitting in front of a gray wall. Um, I'm a composer, and I'm also a teaching artist. Um, I work primarily with a uh, with young learners, ages nine to fifteen, in a program called Very Young Composers um, by the New York Philharmonic. And in this program, um, young composers get to create, notate, and hear their very own music performed by professional musicians. Um, I've also been doing some online workshops for the Young Women Composers Camp and the So Precaution uh, Summer Institute. And in the beginning, I would say that for me, it was, I mean, this was very different than if you had just signed up to teach an online course or to take an online course. So it was very much, at least from my experience, survival mode of how do we do this? Um, and how can we translate what we were doing? And I clearly realized that there was no translating of what I was doing. It was just a reimagining of, of what I wanted to, um, of the experiences that I wanted to create for my students. Um, the main thing for me has been, and this sounds right now so simple, but I really did not think about the different modalities, like the multiple modalities of learning when I, um, when I started teaching online or facilitating. And that made a big difference when I started to think more intentionally about those, just remembering um, that it's really important, even though you're sitting at a, um, at a, in a screen, like it's really important to connect with your surroundings. Um, so don't forget about the tactile, like have, um, have learners find something in their room for an activity, touch it, then create something based on that. Close your eyes and listen. Um, it has been really, really important for me and and also in my in my own personal life, and and just kind of uh, like simple things, transitions, standing up, moving. A lot of things that I do naturally in the classroom that I completely forgot when this started. Um, so just. Uh, Kind of um, relearning and, and reminding myself of this and and the most important thing for me has been to um, and this is where the teaching artist uh, comes in I believe it's to to be empathetic and sensitive um, when designing and facilitating creative activities because at least for me this is certainly not the time in which I feel like I can create my best work and or my masterpiece and um, because I went mostly from seeing my students every day and they were working on string quartets and and this pieces that uh 
that Mivo's quartet was going to perform. And it was very, we had very ambitious project for this nine and 10 year olds. And then all of a sudden I was like, okay, how do we continue that? And I was like, I cannot write a string quartet right now. Um, and I, I did, <laughs> I had to, um, and I'll talk about that uh, later. But I, but the main thing for me was to, to kind of um, connect to what I needed at the moment. And maybe that meant that I needed to create my own self-soothing piece because I was feeling overwhelmed. And then I created an activity for my students, an, an audio exploration in which they would, and in which I would guide them into creating their own self-soothing piece. Um, so coming from a place of like, a lot of people are overwhelmed and, and it's really hard to create right now. So I'm um, keeping things simple so that, and low stakes so they feel successful um, and hopefully inspired to continue creating. Thank you, Angelica. Anybody else? What we yeah, learned? if I may, um, I'm Singita. I'm sitting in front of a, a divider uh, to block off the rest of the room because the rest of the life, my life and my home is going on behind me. Um, I have not cut my hair since February. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I'm wearing a blue and white top. Um, I was just going to say that for us, uh, the, the, pe the, the whole situation around COVID caught us in the middle of having to translate a lot of our workshops into internet friendly versions. And then we also ended up rolling out work that was specifically geared towards that moment. So we were kind of caught in a dual moment where we were doing translation and developing new material around encouraging, what we do is we go into communities and encourage participatory imagination and creative projects um, around civics. And so for me, the biggest learnings have been around encouraging multiple entries into participation. So um, under, uh, sort of really retooling to think about any media necessary being a way to think about things. So we now no longer think about a platform specific um, or a mode that's specific, we think about how can, what are, we, what are we trying to accomplish in this step and how can it be done? So if somebody gets disconnected, how can they still accomplish this? And of course we can't 100% accommodate for that, but it has really been helpful to kind of shift our minds to think in that way, as opposed to thinking about now we're online, you must do it this way. Um, and then the other piece sort of more just to make myself feel better is that we've allowed our, we've kind of given ourselves permission to just let things happen. You know, people will get disconnected. Things will not look as polished. Um, and that's actually great. It actually does encourage participation. It puts people at ease. And so we've kind of leaned into allowing like the home life and the professional life to blend on calls and things like that. So, um, which has helped us feel more at ease with the whole transition. Thank you. I love that you're kind of bringing up uh, some of the challenges that we kind of run into is we're and I'm trying to resource in different ways how we want to accomplish what we want to do. Um, what does the arts community need that it doesn't currently have to succeed in the post COVID landscape? I mean, how can we, how can we leverage what we have? Jaja, do you want to take that one on? Sure, we need so many things. I'm gonna start with resources. And um, I was just so shocked yesterday to read that the American Alliance of Museums survey um, revealed that a third of museums will not make it out of this pandemic. So the reality of financial resources, human resources to execute even all these digital projects that we've mentioned is incredibly critical. But I think what I'm excited about in terms of digital transformation is I'm seeing that a lot of the, you know, gigantic shifts in thinking about how we reach our audiences online um, is now moving its way into the cultural sphere. So um, if you think about every other creative sector, whether it's film, music, publishing, um, they've been able to really successfully translate their business into the online world. And the art world is really just beginning to experiment and think about what that means in all of the different forms that creativity might live. Um, I think most importantly, everyone is learning. And I think particularly in this space, we're all gathered to learn from each other. Um, artists and art administrators as lifelong learners, we're now being in 
put into a position where um, I'm sure many people are signing up for webinars and online courses to even teach themselves how to do simple things. So now is kind of the perfect time um, to learn how to build a website, learn how to code, learn how to use all of this existing technology that already um, has been built, right? You don't really have to invent a new technology. There's so much that can be widely accessible to a very broad audience. And I think like Sangeeta said, we also want to think about the lowest common denominator of digital experiences so that we're reaching people across um, all levels of digital literacy, all levels of understanding, you know, what different platforms can be used for. I think artists are the most well equipped to push the limits of this medium and I, I'm very excited to see what happens. Um, I think, you know, it's all about thinking about the tools of our time. So if in traditional um, visual art, when people push the limits and the boundaries of painting or sculpture, um, you know, now our visual experiences are completely limited to the screen. So how is the presentation of art and the interpretation of art going to shift around that? Um, I also think it's really important to look towards the for-profit sector. So very often cultural institutions tend to look at what other museums or performing arts organizations are doing, but in reality, our competitors right now are Netflix and Spotify. So when people are at home and they're um, looking for experiences that are about entertainment or even learning, particularly with um, kids at home for, you know, a very long period from now on. Um, how do we create content that fits the need of how people consume culture currently? So, you know, thinking about content that can be on demand, streaming, um, as opposed to this very traditional broadcast model that institutions had previously operated around. So this idea of live content and um, if you can reach people around the world like we are now um, across time zones, you know, making that content accessible is the most important thing. Anybody else on that one? It occurs to me that, you know, you mentioned, I want to circle back around and do a couple of things, but, but one of the things you talked about, Jasha, was the, that idea of the lowest common denominator, knowing what that is. And it does make me think again about um, the barriers digital platforms present and factoring that into what we, um, what we make available for folks to engage in. So when we think about arts education online, we have to think about those barriers what are some practical strategies that we could institute as um, creators of content that can address the inequities that come up when learning goes digital? I mean, we've, you know, we're just starting to see this this past spring. We're seeing it again this fall. Eric, is that something you could jump in on, start us off with? Uh, sure, John. Happy to. I'm really happy to be here with you all. Uh, just to describe myself and my surroundings, I'm a white male with very rapidly uh, graying hair. Um, very short hair. Um, I'm wearing a black uh, short sleeve shirt. I'm wearing glasses, a wired Apple headset. Um, I'm at my home in DC in front of a white wall and I have a closet door behind me. So it um, gives you a sense of where I am in my little space here. Um, and my team at the Kennedy Center is responsible for a wide range of uh, educational projects, including what you're talking about, uh, John, is really trying to eliminate barriers um, as much as possible for all the educational projects that the Kennedy Center is responsible, you know, is, is out there um, trying to present. Um, you know, when I, there, there are so many different types of inequities and barriers, you know, one of them is just uh, like what, what Jaja was saying, try to make, trying to make our material as accessible as possible to, to as wide an audience as possible um, and trying to figure out what the right ways to do that are. Uh, one of the things that we did, which I think was really, really eye-opening, and I, and I encourage everyone to do this, is to, we, we created a needs assessment survey that we sent out um, to uh, as, as many, as a, to a very large mailing list of folks to try and get feedback on what, what um, parents and educators were really looking for from us as, a, you know, as not just in um, a cultural uh, uh, an arts institution, but also as an educational institution. And that was really, really helpful. Um, and, and some of what it opened up, opened up for us was just that, um, that our materials are getting used and that there is just this, you know, this high demand for 
um, for especially from parents, I think we heard this this strong, strong demand for materials that can be accessed easily, quickly, and that don't necessarily require a you know um, a family or kids or educators or a whole classroom to be sitting at a computer for for uh, long periods of time. So one of the barriers I think that that we're trying to mitigate is not wanting to require people if they want to engage with the arts and arts ed education, not requiring them to be sitting in front of a big computer screen or a television screen for a, some length of time, but to be able to get short activities that they can access, take offline with them. Um, for example, the lesson plans that we are creating on, um, on the Kennedy Center digital platform are, you know, can be accessed not just on the web, but can be accessed and saved as Google Docs and then be modified and be printed out and be circulated and, and, you know, and making sure that those are free, making sure that they're, um, that they're, that they're designed in such a way to be accessible to uh, folks with, with disabilities. And, and you know, so, so really thinking, I think, about accessibility and also thinking about access to digital materials um, in a variety of means. So whether it be through social media, you know, uh, platforms or, um, you know, different video platforms, because we know schools don't always allow um, uh, certain video platforms as we're thinking about the, especially as, the, as we move into the fall and as we came out of the spring and experienced this as well. So different video platforms, but also, you know, mobile friendly. I mean, really all of the different technologies and platforms that um, that people might be using. And then beyond that, thinking about what happens within schools with, uh, for example, closed uh, broadcast systems within schools and trying to access those. We've worked with a number of school systems in the, even just in the DC, um, uh, Maryland, Virginia area to try and make sure that the schools can be um, accessing our stuff, not just through the internet, but also over um, you know, uh, television um, programming channels as well. So. There's a lot to think about there, um, but I think the getting back to that one piece I mentioned is just this idea of short activities that don't require a lot of screen time. That's also really important to us too. So we're working now with teaching artists to produce short bite-sized activity starters, whether that, you know, in dance and theater and visual art, that then uh, kids and families and classrooms of kids can, can kind of do without being in front of the screen and, and kind of extend their learning and not have to be always connected. Has there been any one big change in the way you've been thinking about that since the start of March? Yeah, I mean, I would say that 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 whole um, that whole piece about you know trying to produce um, content in in bite sized chunks, but you know, and also reaching out to as many teaching artists as possible to try and get them to engage with us around creating this material. So one of the big shifts I think has actually been we're trying to put the production um, uh, 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 kind of um, not the onus, but because we're providing a lot of guidance and support, but, but the um, trying to give teaching artists as much guidance and support around production as possible so that they can produce and that then we can help them present. And that's, I think, a big learning that's definitely taken place. Right. And that's a crowdsourcing, right? You're kind of opening right. the open you're putting out a call to all teaching artists to, yeah, to, and try to give you things. Exactly, yeah. You know, Jaja had also mentioned um, uh, thinking about that we deliver, that we think about how what we make fits with how uh, the people who we're trying to engage consume, I think was how you, how you put it, Jaja. And uh, Sangeeta, you have a lot of expertise in that area. I'm wondering if if you might be able to say something about how um, we should be thinking about not just the way young people, if we're thinking about young people, and Helica, you may ultimately be thinking differently about this um, with music, but um, you know, how, what, what should we know about how they engage, not just when they consume, but when they are trying to use media to their own ends? Yeah, um, thank you for that question. I mean, to, to to Eric's um, point, I think it's really important, even more so ev than ever, for educators to understand what 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 media the youth are using, what they're engaging with, what platforms they're on. You know, whether it's TikTok or what what shows are they watching. And then, uh, for us at least, 
before you could kind of, I think, say there's a separation between the classroom and, and their lives. I mean, even though that was always the artificial division, I think now we're work, at least for working with youth who are at home, we're working with youth who are in their lives. They're in their homes, they're, in, they're existing in their context. And so meeting the, the kids where they're at, understanding where, what media they're engaging with, where their interests are, and then connecting to those interests as much as possible, I think is, is, is a very good way to keep them engaged, <laughs> if nothing else, because then we're talking about material that they're already engaging with. And for us, for example, we're working on a toolkit that's, um, that's engaging specifically with pop culture. So what show are you watching with and can we build out on that? Can we do creative exercises around that? Can we add characters to the show that you're watching? Can we do kind of fanish engagements with that? Can we change the plot? Can you compare it with somebody? Um, so I think that that is absolutely an important piece. And then another one is to understand their mode of engagement with, with their content in terms of, you know, are they, are they in the mode of creating 15 second videos as opposed to, you know, a, pair, a, a, a drawing or a two minute video or whatever it is that you're thinking you're going to make your assignment be? Well, how can you connect that as much as possible to the existing media practices that they already have? Um, to make that step to participation again easier. That's where a lot of our energy is going is into encouraging participation because it's that you know that they're not locked in a classroom, so you cannot, I guess, in the language of like force them to do the assignment, right? If you're in a classroom, they're going to work with you, but they're in person. You're going to have now. There's more of a like you need to create the, their demand and their interest in the material, which is really important as well. Um, and for us to kind of also on. To Eric's point, uh, we have definitely been thinking about smaller, um, smaller sequences on that topic, but also ones that can build. So that, for example, if somebody's interested, I just think I think about it about the way that people use media. So, or even their social media accounts. So you may post something, you may quickly like something, but you may actually post a much longer a comment on it, or you may actually share it out, and you may actually. Um, then post something else and an idea and connect it and be starting to have a conversation with somebody and to what it, and how much can we think about the material that we're creating in those ways so that it's modular it can build but it also can be small and bite-sized so if somebody wants to go deep and connect with somebody else about it they can but if it also if they all they want to do is do the first step that's fine too so everybody's participation matters and that I feel is where like our energy at least has been going around that. Does anybody else want to build on that? And Helica, I, I want to circle back around to you because we were talking a lot about um, arts education, but you know, arts, art is a key part of that phrase. So uh, I guess this would be a question for, for you as a, as a composer, but from the artist standpoint, how has um, quarantine impacted your creative process? And I mean, not only moving existing work online, but also creating for digital platforms. It's been very challenging, especially in the beginning. Um, I, I felt uh, kind of a, even, I was very grateful for that to have work, but at the same time, I felt really guilty that I was paralyzed and at first in the, in the first few weeks that I just couldn't create, even though I, um, I felt like, over the past few years, I've developed a routine of showing up to work, even though I'm not, even if every day is not as productive, but still that did not work in, in at least in March and April for me. Um, I, I was very lucky to, um, to get a micro commission um, for a 30 second short piece for solo violin um, by violinist Jennifer Cole. Uh, she's, uh, she did an amazing um, project uh, very early in quarantine and I was like, I can do this. 30 seconds for violin, that's the instrument I grew up playing. I can do this. And then I started, I was like, oh no, I can't. Um, so really what helped me was to think of the things, like remember the things that bring me joy. I literally downloaded a video of dogs playing with a balloon and scored that. And that was my piece for Jennifer. Cause that was something that I was constantly watching because it would calm me down. Um, so that as an entry point really helped me. And then I mentioned before that, uh, in, in reference um, to my students um, that were writing string quartets and saying like at the moment I wasn't able to write a string quartet. Um, I, I actually a few weeks after I finished Jennifer's piece I was um, approached by Kronos Quartet to write a piece for them. 
to be performed over Zoom. And Kronos is, is huge for me. They're one of the reasons why I started writing music. They're one of the reasons of how I discovered that they were living composers. And um, I was extremely excited and also extremely scared because it's, it's my dream quartet with the let's call it less than ideal platform for music and I think musicians um, can and I mean all artists can relate to the challenges of, of Zoom um, but there are some very evident uh, limitations um, for music making through it besides the lag the audio quality there's um, and the first two weeks I was I think I was fighting um, against it and just being frustrated but once I made that shift of really embracing the limitations of the platform and not thinking of them as challenges, but but as compositional material, the same way that like kind of learning a, a new medium. So really considering the medium as important as if I'm writing for if I'm writing for oboe, I know that there are limitations to the register and um, same way thinking of Zoom as that. And and so embracing that and and um, I knew I wanted to create something that was not I've seen some experiments with Zoom and mostly drone pieces and atmospheric pieces work really well. Um, but I wanted to create something rhythmic and and I said, okay, I can create something that's rhythmically active, but that doesn't necessarily depend on precision because as we all know, precision is not something this does very well. Um, so that was for me a big um, kind of uh, a big moment of realizing that that I this is not something that is this frustrating thing. This can actually be something really fun and um, and a new way of learning how to compose. Um, so so yeah, that uh, that's also making me rethink how I how I create now and be and also how I design activities for my students in which they're not trying to recreate something that would happen in person, but how can they also embrace these um, these platforms that have been here for a while, but that a lot of us are now forced to um, to engage with as something that is not uh, which you just have to, but something that is actually another medium that could be potentially really exciting for creating. Thank you, Angelica. I love the idea about thinking about what the affordances of something like Zoom are, you know, the limitations, but also the <laughs> the unique opportunities that it gives you creatively. Um, so I want to, I'll start this off with Jasha, but, but others, please jump in. I'm, I, I'm wondering what is, what is the question that we should be asking ourselves about digital learning and digital platforms that, that we aren't asking. You started to talk about how we're, how on one hand, Jasha, we are behind um, some other sectors. But I love the idea that we have a kind of superpower because we have artists to, think, to, to learn with and alongside. But what is it that we should be asking that we're not? When approaching any digital project, I always start with the same question, which is if technology is the answer, what was the question? So every time we approach a project, it should really address the concise problem we're trying to solve. Um, at the beginning of quarantine, it was actually hilarious to see all of these museums try to um, share all of these virtual projects that had been in the works, but completely, um, you know, not very well engaged um, historically. I think when people think about technology and translation of cultural spaces, um, people immediately pivot to something that's both very expensive and very difficult to achieve, you know, emerging technologies like virtual reality and, um, you know, trying to translate and replicate these architectural spaces, which are in and of itself its own interface. So I think rather than trying to invent something new, we want to think about what are the experiences that people seek when they go to a cultural institution, um, whether it's learning, whether it's social interactions, and how do we use technology to replicate those experiences. Um, something else I've observed among all the speakers is I think we're all grappling with the question of broad versus deep. And with all of the existing platforms, how do we tailor content to that audience? And I think something that many artists don't leverage as a tool is the power of data. So the lucky part of using technology right now is that every platform we use has an immediate 
uh, quantifiable result where we can immediately read how audiences are engaging with our content, whether it's the length of time they're watching a video where you can and use that information and adapt and respond to the platform you might be putting it on or even qualitative feedback from users um, when they comment on social media. So there's an incredible amount of data that I think can really help inform and answer those questions. And all of this is widely available. In some cases, you might know too much. You might know exactly where these people live, what they're interested in um, because of so much data that's been collected by these very widely accessible platforms that we're all using like Google or Facebook. But I would say we should definitely take and use that to our advantage to really help inform how our audiences are responding. So um, I think we want to think about something that's, again, very suited to um, the big picture and the objective. Is there something that we should be asking ourselves of the data that we're not asking right now? Yeah, I think like, like I said before, it's, it's what is the question. So I think you can also get mired in a lot of numbers that really don't speak to anything and end up in this situation of um, analysis paralysis. So I think even when approaching data, you should be asking, you know, what, what is the question I want answered? Um, do I want to know, um, you know, who these audiences are? Do I want to know what they respond to? Do I want to know, um, you know, at what point they drop off in, in engagement? I think there should be a very specific question. Um, and then the numbers will, will hopefully um, answer part of the answer, of course. Yeah, that's really interesting, Jaja. I totally agree with you. I think one of the things we did, a big question that we asked ourselves was, what is it that we already do that we're, what are we strong in? Let's not necessarily try to go out and do something that we've never experienced before, never tried to do before, like VR or something like that, really get, you know, that would have been a real distraction. But what do we already do? And then to your point about data, what is it that folks are coming to us for? What do they want from us, you know, and as an institution? And what are we providing that's of real value? And it really helped ourselves, to, you know, when we started asking those questions and also, as I said, kind of conducting a survey to get some more feedback from our audiences about it, it really helped us to um, to really focus on our priorities. And one of those things was, um, you know, was about wraparound activities and wraparound extension of, of things. So what Sangeeta was saying before, I totally agree with that, you know, we sometimes you might create something small, but other, but then someone wants to explore that further and take it and build on that learning. So I think we, one of the things that we do a lot of at the Kennedy Center is performances. So um, it's huge, it's really important. It's, it's even, even within the education division, we have a lot of you know, um, theater and performances for young audiences. So how do we build, you know, take those, you know, turn them into you know, something virtual, which is not terribly hard to do as long as we have the, the footage and we can get all the permissions, which obviously also takes work and time. Um, but then build the wraparound for those. So build activities that educators or parents and, or families, guardians, even kids themselves can do before they watch a performance and then can kind of extend their experience and do after the performance. We were already doing that, but now I think it's a matter of, of building on that and doing more of it because we realize partly from the data that, we're, that we have access to that that is what folks are looking to us for at this, in this moment. I think for me, if I may, it's kind of, I may pivot it a little bit in a different direction and speak from my perspective as a parent <laughs> I love a, of a child who's been negotiating all the distance learning and all this, the debates around it. And I know that they're multifaceted, but I kind of want to speak from my experience where I've seen, or I've been frustrated and have been, have been very kind of engaged in the discussion has been around assumptions about how, what kind of engagement is associated with different modes of of participation. So like what, you know, this uh, online learning is kind of the isolated learning model where you're learning and submitting worksheets is what a lot of the sort of discussion that I've seen. And for the social engagement, we need to have kids face to face, right? That's like a lot of the, I'm constructing a somewhat artificial binary, but that's very much like how I've experienced the discussion around my son's education. And my frustration around that is that that's actually, to me at least, and from our research, that's not how young people see it. Like that's not how they've been experiencing their lives. They, they engage with each other through their platforms in many ways, you know, they're chatting, they're posting things, they're engaging, they're, they're talking to each other. Um, and in fact, uh, in a classroom where they're not allowed to speak to each other, they have to be six feet apart, all of that, the assumption that that is by itself a social space 
um, has been something that's been kind of a, a frustrating to me. And I feel kind of coming out of that, I feel like we really need to ask ourselves what assumptions we have about different uh, platforms and different media forms and whether we need to upend those assumptions a little bit and to Jaja's question, ask why are we using, what is it that we're trying to accomplish? So not necessarily what's the problem, what, what are kind of, what are we trying to accomplish? And why this, why are we making an assumption about this technology being the right solution? It might not actually be, and I'm speaking of face-to-face -face as a technology here. So it might not actually be the only solution that we have on hand to solve that. And I feel like we're I sort of, I'm trying to see a little bit of silver lining here um, I think we're at a place where a lot of our assumptions are at a place where we can upend them and we should be questioning them. We should be questioning some of the established practices and assumptions that we have around the ways in which we engage and the ways in which we teach and the ways in which we create with youth. And I feel like we should grab it. We should take it. You know, we shouldn't, we shouldn't let the back to normal pressure um, just stifle our creativity around this um, as much as we can, of course, recognizing all the constraints that we're facing and the real issues that we all have on hand. But I, I get, I feel like I want to see more of that. Um, and so, and I'm starting to see it, and I'm, but I'd like to see even more. Any other big questions? I have one other question, Sangeeta, since, <clears throat> since you just spoke, but, um, I know in our work, and I think because artists, when they are facilitating, you know, art, it's the domain of art that it engenders multiple perspectives. And so folks who are um, facilitating, I know that when we are constructing experiences, we think a lot about um, how to um, negotiate multiple perspectives, how to facilitate that kind of dialogue. And I'm wondering if you could say, if there's anything you can say about um, what you've learned or what you've known, what, what you've come to know about um, facilitating multiple perspectives. And I know that for you, it's not always necessarily multiple opinions or divergent opinions, but also multiple visions. And, you know, you've, you've talked in your work about paradoxes and differences, but I'm wondering if you could speak to that just for a minute. Yeah, I, if I thank you for that question. Um, yeah, so in our work, we reach to the imagination to discuss fraught political and civic issues in communities across many, a broad range of ages. So we've worked with elementary school students all the way up to people in, in senior home facilities. So we've really gone quite broad with, our, with the people that we've worked with. And what, what our approach is, and I, that's all I can speak to, is what we've been doing. I'm sure that there are other methods out there, um, is that we have been reaching to we don't go in to discuss the issue and we don't start with the issue, which I know for an arts community is probably not a surprise, but for a sort of more civics entry point, that is a surprising way to enter. And we actually enter through the imagination and creative storytelling and um, collect, uh, participatory art making. So we ask people, for example, we ask people to bring in, each person brings in a memory object as something that is significant to them personally. And that is where they start from. And then, so they all share that, and usually that, whether depending on the background that they come on come from, they, these could be very different. We've worked with um, coal miners in Kentucky and all kinds of places where really there were very fraught tensions in the room. But sharing a memory object generally and inevitably um, humanizes everybody in the room, and we start from there. And then we have people work with those memory objects to create creative stories together. So now they're each owning a element of a story, but they don't, and no one of them has the full story. And in doing that, they're having to start to negotiate a lot of values and, dis and issues, but they're doing it through the medium of the story. And they're doing it through the medium of creative storytelling. And to me, that is, I would almost say like that's the only way to do it in the current moment. Uh, in my experience of trying to have some of these discussions directly, um, I think we're in a moment of great division and it's very, very difficult to go in and have those discussions um, in the language that people are used to using around fraught issues. So this, I, I really believe that, that, that there's hope in this. There's, I see great hope in this approach. And have you continued with that approach digitally since we've yes. been limited? To so, yes, thank you for that. Yes, so we have actually pivoted to creating um, different ways to do this online. We, 
have a toolkit coming out in the fall around pop discussions around pop culture that it's geared towards parents and to, that will have a way for people to share their perspectives online and rework them and the idea is that this is constantly building so people will submit their um, their observations and those will become part of the packet that the next group will get to use. And we've also developed an atlas where people are sharing their stories and then we have other people remixing those stories collectively to, to create new stories. So we have all that happening online as well now, asynchronously. So at this point, I just want to ask all four of you, do any of you have any do any of you have any follow-up questions? Could be follow-up, could be a new question. Do you, any of you have any questions for any of the other panelists? I guess I have a question. I, I see some questions also in the chat about this, um, some permissions and um, constraints around privacy issues and that's, I don't deal with that as much, but I, I can imagine that that's a huge issue, especially with young learners. And so I'm curious if in that work, you, if, and, and in the digital space, it comes, it takes on a different dimension. And so I'm actually curious about how you're dealing with that because I haven't fully encountered it, but I can see it around the corner. Dealing with rights and permissions? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I've, uh, I, I also saw that question and I was thinking how um, abrupt the, the change was in the beginning of this, um, at least from my experience um, with the very young composers of seeing my students every week to all of a sudden the same thing because it's young learners, we can't engage with them um, via Zoom. Um, so it was from, uh, seeing her, uh, from, so from seeing them every day, um, not every day, but every week, but a shift, a big shift to creating asynchronous um, materials. So the whole, and this program is so one-on-one, -on -one. you're engaging with the kids, you're helping them get their ideas down on the page so a professional musician can play it, to talking to an empty wall in my basement and to just hoping that, you know, my this would reach my students. There was also different um, kind of setting in terms of audience because now we were expected to create content um, that was geared towards our students, but that also anyone could um, could use as a prompt, as a creative prompt to create something new. Um, so, so that was that was really challenging, just emotionally to um, to do that shift. But I I feel that at least um, on my end, it really helped to um, to continue engaging with students by email and their parents too. Um, as well as I had to make phone calls too. Uh, and especially with, uh, there, there were, I have a few students that, that speak, um, not them, but their parents speak primarily Spanish. So talking to them, um, giving them a call, I know, or reaching out to them um, via WhatsApp, because I know that's what they use. So just finding ways to connect with the parents to keep the kids engaged um, was really helpful in the beginning. And then that, um, I, I felt that made a difference in, in the amount of, of projects we were getting back from the kids because even though they were small um, small projects, still it was, we were putting them out in the world, but it was, we were not getting as many <laughs> things back as we were hoping to understandably. There's just, I mean, we've talked about so many of these limitations and um, and even access to, to, to just a device. So, um, and I haven't done this, uh, personally, but I married to someone that works for the Department of Education. So I hear constant communications about other ways of doing this in the world of self, of computer science for um, for kids. And another thing that I've been hearing is sending actual printed packages of learning materials to families that don't have access to, um, to a computer or a stable internet uh, connection. And as a as a way of, of also giving them the opportunity to um, to engage in the same, in the in with the same activities, in a, but in a different way. Um, so just thinking about all, it's you have to be very intentional and think very carefully about how to engage with each student. It's a lot of work, but I think it's it's worth it. Any other thoughts on that question or other questions? I've been observing that a lot of questions are coming in about specific examples about technology yes. projects. 
And I'm curious among the panelists, um, what's been the most inspiring technology project that you've observed during this period? Well, you know, since it's a, something that John brought up before, um, our, our excitement couldn't have been better and our timing was so wonderful in terms of working with Mo Willems on his Lunch Doodles project. I think that was pretty low tech really when you think about it. I mean, he, um, you know, Mo was basically uh, producing those pieces with, with very little support in his home studio and, um, and drawing, you know, he was doodling and he was teaching um, a, sh a quick lesson without a lot of interaction but he, we were also collecting back in drawings from kids um, with caregivers' permission to, to you know, send those via, basically just via email and um, getting those drawings and being able to share them back out, getting their questions and Mo being able to answer those questions in his next day's um, you know, broadcast. And I think, you know, again, it was, we didn't go, there, was, there wasn't even any animation. Um, there was very little, uh, uh, post-production work done on those. I mean, it was just like, let's go as simple as possible. And that's kind of what we've tried to do, you know, with a lot. It's like, we've, we've definitely changed our, you know, our expectations with regard to how polished something needs to be. Let's just see if we can get meaningful content out there to folks. Um, that's not exactly an answer to your question, Jaja, but it's, you know, definitely like it was the most exciting, you know, kind of you know, setting of a precedent for us and for, I think for some, um, for other work from other artists out there as well, um, kind of project to be involved with. And we learned a ton from that. So if I may, uh, I have some examples and these are kind of, I don't know, I guess I'm giving plugs to people, but I did that, I have no affiliation with these organizations or companies, so I'm not, I'm not endorsing them in any way. Um, so just starting from like the most exciting artistic videos for me, the, uh, have been music videos, like sort of music dance videos um, that are put together um, by people dancing asynchronously and then edited together. There are multiple iterations of this. And I just, some of them have really, I mean, I've had a full kinesthetic reaction to those in watching those. And I, I've just been blown away. But there have been a few that I've just been like, oh my goodness, this is like, I feel like I am dancing in the, in the screen. So I think there's really, exciting potential there and it's not that they're high tech it's just it is in the secret of the editing and the the choreographic cueing of how they are working with that so that is one example specifically that makes me really excited um, a space that i'm watching just because again as a parent but also in terms of just getting really practical learnings i've been my son's been taking classes throughout school and um, which is a, a platform for online learning for for young people i think ages from three to 18. Um, and I'm just learning a lot from every educator that my son engages with in that, in that session. I learned many, many tips about how this works. I'm kind of observing on the sides to see how what works. And so that's been really exciting uh, for me to see. And then a platform sort of related to the first observation around this asynchronous recording that then gets put together, which I think has a great, people want to feel like they're together. They want to feel like they're co-located and we can't be in the same way that we have been. Um, my son has been doing some vid hugs, which is I guess also a company that does, you know, these like video hugs that you can easily edit together then into short sequences. And he has, and I have so enjoyed watching that, his, all his classmates, and he's in kindergarten, so all his classmates and him created vid hugs for each other, and it's just been super, I mean, he's just been, I could see his face when he was watching it, he was with his friends, so that's been really great to see. We've got a couple more minutes left, and Jaja, I'm wondering if we could close out, uh, I'd love to close out posing that question of you. So what have you seen out uh, there specifically? that that has really caught your attention and why? Yeah, I've seen just incredible amounts of creativity. Um, one example I'll share that relates to some of what we've been speaking about, um, about, you know, kind of the widest possible platform and thinking about existing, um, you know, live interactions and also about performance. Um, so my example has nothing to do with um, the cultural space, but an incredible use of technology that's also very low lift. Um, a couple weeks ago, there was a company, I think a digital agency, um, they decided to recreate every, every episode of The Office, the TV show on Slack, the um, you know workplace chatting platform. So 
from Monday to Friday, nine to five, you could tune into a Slack channel and watch characters from the office interact with, with each other by recreating these live episodes. And I just thought it was such a great way of translating um, a live performance through technology. And in some ways, when you think about performance, it's incredibly predicated on the existence of technology. You need video documentation, you need recordings to even communicate that something like that exists. So just again, using something that's very widely accessible, very widely available, that everyone could have access to um, is just such a smart way of reading, a, reaching a broad audience, and then also, of course, you know, entertaining and and finding ways to to you know insert your content into everyday life.